Legislative action looms on several key bills at the State House as controversy and non-election year politics heat up. We sit down for an update with Iowa House Speaker Linda Upmeyer on this edition of Iowa Press. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation, the Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. I'm a dad. I am a mom. I'm a kid. I'm a kid at heart. I'm a banker. I'm an Iowa banker. No matter who you are, there is an Iowa banker who is ready to help you get where you want to go. Iowa bankers, allowing you to discover the genuine difference of Iowa banks. For decades, Iowa Press has brought you politicians and newsmakers from across Iowa and beyond. Now celebrating more than 40 years of broadcast excellence on statewide Iowa Public Television. This is the Friday, March 16 edition of Iowa Press. Here is David Yepsen. We're about two thirds of the way through the 2018 Iowa legislative session. A compromising video of former Republican Senate leader Bill Dix dominated headlines earlier this week and forced him to resign from office. Meanwhile, lawmakers still have to make important decisions about tax policy, funding cuts for the current fiscal year and a budget for next year, and various other hot-button issues. Plus, it's an election year. Well, here to talk about it all, we've invited Speaker of the Iowa House, Linda Upmeyer, a Republican from Clear Lake, to update us on the roadmap forward. Madam Speaker, welcome back to Iowa Press. Thank you for inviting me. Good to see you. Across the table, Barbara Rodriguez is the political reporter for the Associated Press in Iowa, and Kay Henderson is news director at Radio Iowa. Madam Speaker, let's begin by talking about what Mr. Yepsen just mentioned. When you first heard about this compromising image that showed uh, the former Senate Republican leader kissing a lobbyist, what was your first reaction? And what do you say to voters who say this confirms all their suspicions about politicians? Well, I think my first uh, reaction was one of surprise and then disappointment. Um, certainly, we've had those conversations over the last months. We hired a human resources director to make sure we were addressing these issues um, in, in a sort of the best practice kind of way. We asked her to uh, recommend our, our training, which we've carried out training. Uh, with members and we asked her to make recommendations uh, to uh, move forward with best practices. So this is uh, of course disappointing and I, I, I want Iowans to understand that I don't believe and I don't see this to be usual behavior and, um, and, and so I think it's unfortunate when we have uh, an instance like this. but. Uh, Legislators are in Des Moines working hard on their behalf, and this is not what I see happening. Are you concerned about the ethics of all of this in terms of the questions that it may raise about whether a lawmaker was swayed uh, towards certain policy that might favor a lobbyist? That's the question that we're working with the HR director to answer best practices uh, regarding those questions because I think it's a question that industry faces and struggles with and certainly government does too. Um, I think uh, the idea that we have uh, uh, very open uh, kinds of disclosure when, when those relationships do exist and um, then sort of setting up parameters perhaps, but, but certainly that's something we wrestle with. It doesn't look like there's a lot of uh, explicit rules in the, in the chamber rules about prohibiting such a relationship. Is that something that needs to change? Well, I think we're interested in having conversations about, uh, again, best practices and recommendations, things that have worked perhaps in other states or in other industries. Um, so I think we're listening. Is that something that needs to happen this session? Well, we'll see. If, if there's something that we can move forward, uh, we're willing to do that. It's truly a challenge knowing what that is. We hold ourselves to a higher standard. We hold each other to a high standard. And uh, so 
when we're aware of, of situations where there are relationships. Certainly, uh, I, I mean, I think we all know that, that some of those exist. There are couples who have been married for a long time in that kind of environment, and they uh, set up firewalls for themselves where they don't have those discussions, uh, and they prevent those conflicts. But I, uh, that's certainly the expectation, and if we need to do something else, uh, well, we're interested in knowing what that might be. One thing you have to do this session is the budget. We do. Two big budgets, one for fiscal 18, which is the fiscal year we're currently in, it ends June 30th, mm -hmm. and then one for fiscal 19, which starts after that. Mm -hmm. You got some good news from a revenue estimating conference about additional uh, revenue being available in the current fiscal year. There was a lot of fear about cuts having to be made. Do you think cuts still have to be made to the current fiscal year, and if so, where are they going to come from? I do. I believe we need to make sure, first of all, we're about, we're nearly six million dollars uh, away from a balanced budget, even with the revenue estimate standing where it is. We also believe we need a small cushion, at least some level of cushion. You know, when you think about the budget and the revenue estimate, one-tenth of one percent means seven million dollars. So you've really got to be spot on if you want to cut it that close. So we think it's important to have uh, at least a small cushion moving forward. I think the bill that the House moved forward, the one that the governor is very similar in amount to the governor's uh, recommendation, I think those make sense. They leave uh, some cushion, they balance the budget, and um, I think they're consistent with what we've told departments that they might expect. What about fiscal 19? What can we expect in the budget for the year that begins on the 1st of July? Well, I think on, uh, on the 19 budget, we're, we're still deciding where the, what the size of the pie is. That's a step one in, in that uh, calculation. And then dividing it up in the priorities of Iowa. And so we make sure that we're covering education, health care, and corrections, those are the, and courts. Those are the biggest ones that we have to uh, work with, making sure we cover that. But uh, I think we want to be cautious. We want to plan and uh, uh, and be prepared so that we, again, have a balanced budget, but we're meeting the needs of Iowans. Another big issue in front of the legislature is tax cuts. Mm -hmm. The Senate has passed a massive bill, historic bill, uh, and sent it to the House. The governor has a proposal. Uh, what what does the House have to have in, in its proposal? What's, what's the middle ground here that you're going to wind up on? I think the thing that's most important to members of the House is that we are not uh, hanging on to dollars that were generated because of the federal tax cut and then the fact that we have federal deductibility, which um, may or may not stay around, but nonetheless, uh, you can imagine that Iowans would have a smaller federal bill to deduct from the state and they could end up paying a higher state tax. I don't think that was ever intended when, uh, when we got tax cuts at the federal level, and we want to make sure those dollars stay in Iowa's pockets. So that will be kind of step one for us moving forward in a tax bill. And then building off that as we uh, think very carefully and plan, uh, looking at the runs moving forward, if we can do more, we're, we're certainly interested and willing to do more. Madam Speaker, let's talk about the governor's sure. uh, tax plan because it's the one that House Republicans have indicated that they're going to work off of. It's about 1.7 billion over several years. And one of the things that has been advertised heavily is these uh, economic triggers sort of as a safeguard. Um, but one of the things about these triggers is that they don't reverse if we do reach a point where we've made some cuts and, and then we're, we're stuck with, with, with cuts. So what do you do there? Do you raise the taxes back? Do you have to make additional cuts to government services? You know, that you bring up a really good point because we noticed the very same thing. And if you recall back a number of years, we had a real spike in our revenue only to have it plummet uh, a year or two later. So you make a really good point. And one of the things we've been striving for over the years is to find a way to eliminate some of those peaks and valleys and smooth out the, the, the budget so uh, you weren't deappropriating and reacting every time you had some movement. So we're still trying to do that. And one of the things that we did notice is uh, as you apply those triggers, perhaps we need to have them uh, move in a little different way. So um, if you have a big peak in your revenue, you're not tripping every one of the triggers as you uh, all at once. That you uh, kind of set the pause and set dollars aside 
to trigger the next movement. But that's what we're looking at as well. We don't want to end up in a situation where um, we didn't plan properly and prepare properly, and then we only um, look at how we deappropriate again. David mentioned the budget. Now we're talking about taxes. Yes. Which comes first, the chicken or the egg here? <laughs> Do you have to pass this tax cut package to know what next year's budget should look like? You know, we, uh, th th that's another good question because we struggled with it initially. And what we did was try and treat uh, both the budget and the tax bill uh, with sort of a target. So we know what our target is for spending. We know what we need uh, to maintain the prior priorities of Iowans and still be, you know, we're fiscal conservatives, so we're going to keep that growth at, uh, at a pace that we're comfortable with. But at the same time, then looking at what uh, revenue we can plan for and prepare for and sort of have a target for the tax bill as well. So I think we can do that uh, in a way that that as soon as we move one, the other one has to move. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it's really kind of a balloon, and you keep poking one here, and it pops up over here. The data shows that this isn't going to be revenue neutral, and I'm curious, how do you pay for that? For the, again, the, the variations of expected cost over several years, how do you pay for that? Well, first of all, the bill's not finished, so I, uh, you know, what it looks like in uh, moving forward will depend on, on the planning and the preparation, the runs. Every, uh, we're not going to move forward with the bill until we know uh, what the uh, what the effect of that will be. And so we'll look at those runs, we'll look at those numbers, and uh, before we pass anything, we'll, we'll be better prepared. A quick follow-up to, to that point, since mm -hmm. it's maybe shifting and there's going to be some changes, will the public have, what do you consider a, a, the right amount of time for the public to see the final product and lawmakers voting on this? You know, I don't know that there's a, ma a magic number for the amount of time, but once that bill is ready, we will start uh, pushing it out to people to start looking at it. Uh, so there will be time. There, uh, there may be another uh, committee meeting, a subcommittee meeting, uh, but there, there's going to be an opportunity for the public to take a look at it and for us to get feedback uh, from other folks. You know, we're reaching out to other states to find out uh, uh, some of their successes, people like North Carolina, and uh, learning from successes and from people that had struggles. So I think we've got a good opportunity to have lots of eyes on this um, inside the state once we have something that there's really something to look at. Last week, you told Barbara and I and other State House reporters that your word was prudent. Yeah. Uh, in terms of how big this tax cut should be, Senate Republicans have endorsed a billion dollars a year. The governor is a fraction of that. What is the number that House Republicans have chosen as their target for cutting taxes every right. year annually? Right. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. Right, right now we're starting with the governor's number because we know that that was built into her plan. And based on that number, if we find opportunities that exceed that, then we might move it up. But um, right now we're working with the governor's number. Uh, a quick question about something else related to taxes. Uh, the legislature passed property uh, tax, uh, tax cuts in 2013, um, and that included money for local governments, sort of this backfill. Um, what will the House do on that? Well, if you recall... Should it be phased out, just sure. to make sure that's a clear question? Yeah, no, sure. Uh, you know, if you remember some of that debate, uh, some of us remember the debate back in, 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 when we, we did that property tax bill. A five-year uh, five year phase out or a five-year ending was contemplated in that bill and, and in that bill until uh, the last moments before it was agreed to and passed. So in many people's mind, that, that always had an end point. Uh, I think we're, we've come to the point that we realize now, when we're looking at where expenditures are uh, across our, our budget, we're very proud of the fact that we've invested uh, 765 million new dollars in education. The second fastest growing expenditure in the state is actually dollars sent to local governments. We have gone to from about 150 million dollars in uh, 11 or 12 to nearly 480 million dollars today. One thing I know is that we can't fund both state government and local government. So we need to move back uh, and um, start moving 
moving that responsibility back to the local governments and moving away and lowering the number at least that we're sending back. Uh, so I, I think that's important to do and in, in my conversations with uh, local governments, I, I think some of them have predicted it. If you look at some of their budgets recently, uh, um, oh, I, uh, one of them that I saw recently in the newspaper was um, I think like a 16% increase in their budget on top of pretty large uh, increases to uh, elected officials and bonuses. Um, so I think there's room in at least in many places to make some changes. One final tax related question. The sure. governor in January during her condition of the state message said let's not cut corporate income taxes until next year and we study and we figure out how corporations react to the federal tax changes. The Senate plan includes a corporate tax cut. Uh, will House Republicans go along with that or will they wait until next year? I think the conversation, I, we're kind of open to either conversation. I think here uh, the governor is correct that there's a case to be made for uh, seeing how the how things sort of settle after the federal tax uh, reform and those tax cuts. Her focus and my focus are on average working Iowans. That's who needs to be at the front of the line. If we can do more, if we can plan further, then absolutely we can do that. But I, I think that's where we need to focus our energy first. Democrats say the one thing you've got to do is to do something about all these tax credits. The mm -hmm. part reason the state's budget is uh, bear is you're giving too much money to corporations, including corporations, big corporations that don't need it. Is plugging those uh, credits, is that an option Republicans are thinking about here? Well, you know, we put that on the table last year and we've talked about it. I think uh, lots of things are on the table. And those conversations that we had regarding some of those tax credits were in many cases Right. If you're going to shift our, our tax burden, then we, we can have that conversation. So I think all of that is part of the discussion as we move forward. Still? Uh, well, it's still on the table. If, if we take up corporate uh, tax cuts this year, then I think that's true. Because Democrats saying you're not going to do that because you've got too many friends in big corporations and they don't want to see that. Well, let's, let's be honest, the biggest tax uh, credit out there is the earned income tax credit. And uh, historical tax credits are very popular. Those are popular in our communities and those are things that benefit uh, low income Iowans. So I, I think there's many good uses of tax credits. There's others that we can have discussions about as well. And what about putting uh, the sales tax on internet sales? Well, if we're going to modernize uh, modernize our tax system, I think that's a discussion we need to have. So many of those, I think, um, I, I think Iowans agree. They understand and agree with uh, the idea of that Main Street fairness. Right. And 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 I think we support that. Uh, they're less uh, less. They, they start to get a little startled when you say, "But Netflix." They're oh wait, Netflix. Well, that might be different. I don't know. <laughs> and so I think TV. that's. I know it's a different a difference. So I I do think we have to continue that conversation. If we can uh, move beyond that yet yeah, this year, perhaps. Don't but tax my Netflix. Right? I know that's what we hear. Right. Uh, Madam Speaker, just want to switch gears here a little bit and talk about mm -hmm. abortion. Uh, the legislature is considering a ban on abortions once a heartbeat is detected um, what will the house what, what what does the house want to do on this you know I expect that we'll have a decision out of committee and and that it will move out of committee we'll know for sure here uh, soon but um, I, I mean it's pro-life caucus and I uh, they're very interested in adding I was weight uh, to the constitutional question. We have a 40-year-old case law that is, um, is the threshold that we're trying to all work around as we develop legislation, whether it's the late-term abortion ban that we passed in Iowa, other states are passing 15 weeks, eight weeks, it's kind of all over the map. And we're trying to, we want to add our weight to that constitutional question. Does that weight mean taking it up to the U.S. Supreme Court, Iowa doing that? I think, well, I, th I think Iowa adds its weight to that. I think there are many states that are uh, ahead of us in that line, but I think we become another state that is asking that question. This past week, school students across the nation, including some in Iowa, walked out of class as a protest against school violence. What sort of school violence initiatives will clear the legislature in Iowa this year? 
Well, we've already started on a few of those, actually. I view uh, some of our the work in the mental health bill as something that's going to increase our, our school safety. I think the, the bill that allowed for sharing, uh, the weighted sharing of a social worker in schools. I think a big piece of what we um, what we might lack in some places is just that person or someone that's going to observe someone that's in a in a crisis or in in a, a time where uh, they they might make those kinds of decisions. The suicide prevention bill, I think, is a piece of that. The making sure that save dollars and pebble dollars can be used uh, for. Um, for school safety, so if you don't have the single entry uh, to a school, 20% of the schools do not. So this would uh, make sure that they can use their resources for that, uh, for changing out windows if they think that's what they'd like to do, for having a actual security guard in the schools. They could use flexibility dollars for that. So I think we've got several pieces that go toward that. At the end of the day, school boards in communities in conjunction with their administration have to decide what's best for that community. I, I don't think the schools in my district necessarily are exactly like a Des Moines school system or uh, you know a large urban center. They're small rural schools. So the way they approach it may be different, but we want to have that flexibility available for schools. The Senate passed an active shooter requirement yes. that you have mm -hmm. yearly. You're okay with that? I, I am. I think that uh, the training is important, whether it's yearly or biannually, whatever. But, but I think it is important. Uh, Florida's legislature, Republican-led, a Republican governor, have enacted new gun measures. Will gun measures be part of this discussion in Iowa? You know, I know Representative Winchell is having those discussions. Iowa has uh, good gun laws right now, I believe. And um, I, I'm, Representative Winchell is taking input from uh, both chambers, uh, both sides of the aisle. And we'll see where that goes. Um, Madam Speaker, also switching gears again towards health care. Um, we're about to hit the two-year mark of privatizing Medicaid. Um, there have been some concerns for a long time about uh, that privatization. The House passed a bill that looks like it's aimed at addressing some of those concerns. Does, does this bill solve all the problems? Well, I think several things have been done addressing this issue. I think the governor stepped up uh, uh, immediately at the beginning of the year with her uh, opening address and talked about the fact that this was too, too bumpy. It was too difficult and she wanted to fix it. I think she started that by hiring new personnel. Uh, Director Foxhoven was applauded and praised when she named him um, uh, to, to lead the department. Now it's disappointing that we can't seem to get him approved because we'd rather, uh, some would rather have an election uh, talking point than somebody competent leading the department. But we do have a competent director. We do have a new Medicaid director and a new actuary. But our members believe we still need another, another piece. So that's why we passed the bill that included some oversight it included um, some audit, and uh, I think uh, all of that in combination puts us in a really good position to move forward and uh, with a much improved system, and we'll know that. The Department of Human Services has held some private meetings with um, some providers and the managed care companies about some of the issues. We, the public doesn't have a lot of information about that yet. Um, is it, should the legislature wait to get more intel about about those meetings to get a sense of what needs to be in a final bill on Medicaid? You know, honestly, the, the department can do most of the things we've even got in the bill on their own with our, without our uh, requiring them to. They're having those meetings. I'm confident that the outcome of those meetings, the product of those, will uh, be an impetus for them to make changes inside the department. And I don't think they'll need us to, to have that happen. But we'll, we'll certainly be prepared if there are recommendations that they need uh, our uh, approval for, we'll certainly be ready. And very quickly also, I know that you've wanted to address rising premiums with the Affordable Care Act. The legislature is considering some pieces of legislation that would essentially <laughs> offer skimpier health insurance. Um, is that a, a concern that, that that might destabilize further the the healthcare system in Iowa. Is this the plan the Farm Bureau wants uh, mm -hmm. wants you to enact? Is that going to go? 
You know, I, I think we need to move forward with uh, several pieces of legislation, actually, that uh, help uh, the 60 to 70,000 Iowans that are facing uh, $30,000 to $40,000 uh, premiums uh, that they're going and borrowing money to pay. Uh, we're going in the wrong direction. I think uh, the bill that Waylon Brown, uh, Senator Brown, brought forward with association plans, I think that's a step. Representative Heaton's bill to allow um, doctors to offer just per member per month uh, prices for well wellness, uh, the usual uh, uh, office visits, and I think the bill that was brought forward to allow um, a little different kind of a plan. I think those are all good options. Uh, when we have the federal government that should be fixing this and they're not, this is what we can do, and I think we should. One of the things I have to do is conclude the program because <laughs> we're out of time. <laughs> Madam Speaker, way too many issues. Thank you. There for are. Thank you for taking time to be with us. We well, thank you. Hope it was you're pleasure. back to talk about the rest of them. Sometime. Oh, I'm happy to. <laughs> you bet. And thank you for joining us. We'll be back with another edition of Iowa Press next week at our regular times, Friday night at 7:30 and Sunday at noon on our main IPTV channel with a rebroadcast on our Dot Three World channel Saturday morning at 8:30. For all of us here at Iowa Public Television. I'm David Yepsen, and thanks for joining us today. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation, the Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. I'm a dad. I am a mom. I'm a kid. I'm a kid at heart. I'm a banker. I'm an Iowa banker. No matter who you are, there is an Iowa banker who is ready to help you get where you want to go. Iowa Bankers, allowing you to discover the genuine difference of Iowa banks.